It is my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker for today. We are so delighted to have with us uh, Seth Goldman. Uh, Seth, as you know, is, C, uh, is the CEO of Honesty and the co-founder. Uh, he created the company in, back in 1998 with Professor Barry Nailbuff of the Yale School of Management. Uh, today, Honesty is the nation's top-selling organic bottled tea, specializing in organic uh, beverages that are both fair trade certified and just a tad sweet. That's a registered trademark. Um, in uh, March 2011, they were acquired by the Coca-Cola company, so they're the first organic and fair trade brand um, in the, within the world's largest beverage distribution system. Th that uh, transaction helped deepen the reach and impact of Honest Tea's mission. Uh, Honest uh, beverages are now carried uh, in more than, uh, over 100,000 outlets throughout the country. And the company continues to deepen its relationships with fair trade uh, certified suppliers in India, China, and South Africa. Uh, Seth continues to lead the enterprise out of Honesty's eco-funky headquarters, which is just up the road in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, in, uh, last year, Seth was recognized by the United States Healthful Food Council with a Real Food uh, Innovator Award for helping change the food landscape by providing options that are healthier for both the body and the planet. Uh, Seth serves on the boards of the American Beverage Association, Bethesda Green, Beyond Meat, and Ecologic Solutions, and on the advisory boards of Net Impact and the Yale School of Management. Uh, September 2013, uh, Seth and Barry celebrated the release of their first business book, Mission in a Bottle, The Honest Guide to Doing Business Differently and Succeeding. Uh, it's, uh, there's a copy of the book on every seat, so if you were smart enough to get here early, you now own a copy of the book. Uh, and Seth will be sitting outside. Um, there's already an autograph panel inside the book, but if you want an extra autograph <laughs> or advice, uh, Seth will be sitting outside immediately. We are, we are over. Uh, please join me in giving a very warm Seaway welcome to Seth Goldman. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. It's very really nice to be here. I, I have been, um, Honest Tea has been based in uh, the D.C. area for 17 years, but I haven't actually gotten to address a, a, a group of students from Catholic, so I'm really excited to do it. And, and nice to connect with you. And as we were walking over, the dean was talking about the, the desire to help create uh, an idea of a people-centered or people-driven um, business. And we talk about our business as a mission-driven business, which I know obviously is a concept you can relate to as well, the idea that there's a higher purpose to what we do. I come from the Jewish faith, and there's a phrase in um, the Jewish scripture that says, justice, justice shall you pursue. And the question that, that the, um, when you discuss this passage is, why do they re repeat the phrase justice? Why don't you just say, justice shall you pursue? And my interpretation is that the reason they repeat it is because you, you shall pursue justice, but it's not just, just pursuing justice, it's how you pursue it that's important. So for example, if we were a cigarette company and we gave away all our profits to wonderful charities, the, the means by which we're pursuing that justice would not be righteous. And so the idea is that the righteousness on its own isn't enough, it's how you pursue it that's all as important. And that's what we're trying to build with Honest Tea. And I want to share with you a bit today about our journey, what we've been doing, how we've been striving and to build and scale this business and what we say, still keep it honest. So first of all, as you know, we're here in the Washington, D.C. area, and this can be an area that can be occasionally um, depressing, right? There's not always uplifting headlines from the big business down the street. And yet I want to assure you, uh, occasionally positive things do happen with our government. This was a picture of President Obama last year signing a bill, and if you look on the corner of his desk, he's got a bottle of honest tea. This is the uh, Resolute desk. And now somebody said, well, what you really should have done is try to Photoshop the picture so you know the tea is facing out. I said, well, that wouldn't have been honest to do that. But, but it is nice to know that, you know, presidents and their handlers are pretty meticulous about brands. They don't want um, to necessarily be associated with the brand. And yet we know that uh, Honest Tea has been <laughs> cited frequently with uh, the, the chief executive. All right, so I'm going to take, let's go far away from Washington for a second. I want to share with you some slides from a trip I took to China a few years ago. We source all of our green tea from China and all of our black tea from India. And so I had been on a, um, a this is an Anhui province, south central China, relatively poor province. And I had flown a long way, driven a long way, flown again, driven again. And eventually, we, my hosts took me down this um, path. They, you know, the road came to an end. And um, 
they said, well, we have to you know, walk down this path to get to the tea bushes. And I get to the end of the path, and there's a river. And I still don't see any tea bushes. And I, I said, well, um, you know, we are here to see the tea bushes, right? So, oh, yeah, yeah. And I wonder if I'm in one of those Zen parables where, you know, you've already been with the tea bushes, you just didn't realize it. So, so I said, um, I didn't see any bridge. And I said, well, have you thought about building a bridge? Because usually in commerce, you need to get your goods to market. And they gave me four interesting reasons why they hadn't built a bridge. I said, well, first, look, this is a, there's a, we're a poor province. We can't just put up a bridge. Just, you know, we don't have the means to do that, the money. Number two, there's a lot of flooding in this part of China. And at one point of the year, the, the bridge could be underwater or far away from land. Number three, this is an organic tea garden. There, there's no need for large bags of chemicals or equipment. But the most interesting thing they said was, look, if we build a bridge, there'll be a road. If we build a road, there'll be infrastructure. And if there's infrastructure, there'll be pollution. So instead of a bridge, this guy came up in a raft, bamboo raft. We got our feet a little bit wet, but we ended up in the tea garden. And for me, it was a really um, kind of a paradigm shift, because I entered a situation and I saw a problem. I said, no bridge, that's a problem. And for this community, no bridge was actually a solution. So you've got a, you've got a country where development is go you know, going incredibly fast uh, and creating lots of problems with the pollution. How do you protect your source, a pristine source, from being contaminated? And for them, not having a bridge was a solution. And if you extend this metaphor and you think about all the problems, we're, we're a very solution-driven society. So we see weeds in a field and we know a solution can be chemical pesticides. But we also now know that those chemical solutions can create other problems that affect our health, that affect our ecosystem. And so there's, if you can, as a, as a as you look at society today, we look at our, whether you talk about health problems, environmental problems, it's very easy to say that business is the problem. But it could be that business can also be a solution. So how do we take some of the problems that exist and maybe apply some of the existing solutions we have. We just may not know they already are solutions. So that's one of the uh, mindsets I've tried to bring to the business. So um, I want to share with you another uh, sourcing uh, experience. This is from Paraguay. So we buy, as I said, our tea from mostly East Asia. We get our sugar, and we buy a lot of organic. We, we use less sugar than most brands, but we still do use sugar. So we buy our organic sugar from Paraguay. And last year, actually exactly at this time, almost to the week, I was in Paraguay because we had just made a shift. We sourced, um, all, we bought organic sugar since from day one. But last year at this time, we made the commitment to source the organic sugar with a fair trade uh, element to it, which means that we invest back in these communities. And so we have a short video I want to show you, if Cecilia can help me here. We're going to give you a little bit of a sense of what it means to source organic and fair trade sugar. We had a lot of goals when we launched Honest Tea. The first was to bring a low calorie drink to market and make it widely available. But another was to find ways to help connect people more closely to the natural world and to support ecosystems that are really under, under threat. So we're in Paraguay, which is the world's largest producer of organic cane sugar. We've come here to gain a fuller appreciation of the communities and the ecosystem that help us bring this crop to market. on my shoulder. <laughs> like that? I like to get my hands dirty, literally. I mean, obviously, I'm not working eight hours a day like these workers are in, in the field, but it helps make sure that I never take for granted all that's involved in, in you know, getting these products out of the earth and getting them into a, a bottle of tea. There we go. <laughs> Putting up the seed cane. It helps uh, start, the, start the, the germination. Sugarcane is a vital part of the Paraguayan economy. And each year, more farmers are making the switch to organic. It starts from the ground up, with natural fertilizers cultivated in this compost field, and continues in the lab, where these researchers are developing alternatives to chemical pesticides by breeding tiny wasps to control cane worms. When we can see a school like this that really is supported by or a commitment to organic and fair trade, that really makes uh, a material difference in this community. Cinco, cuatro, tres, dos, uno, cero! Oh, yeah. <laughs> Every time
time we buy a pound of fair trade sugar, a portion of our purchase goes back to the farmers. And sometimes these premiums are used to buy ambulances and modern farm equipment that helps the farmers increase yields. And sometimes they go to help community members who need an extra hand. They have a small plantation of cane, organic cane. This is the original house that uh, this family lived in, and it, it's a very basic construction, literally sticks and mud and a dirt floor. But they've been working in this field for 60 years, and so what's nice now is that the cooperative uh, provided them with a, uh, came and built a house for them. You know, it's so easy when you see a product on the shelf to just be disconnected not only from the, the earth and the ecosystem it comes from, but also from the people involved. At the end of the day, making a better product is about more than just better taste. It's also about long-term investments in the environment, the farmers, and their communities. So um, we started with making um, our, whoops, we had a lot of gold. We started uh, last year, we launched a lemonade line with Whole Foods that we put uh, fair trade sugar in. And, and so um, that was our first step. And then in the fall, which about four, five months ago, we started incorporating the fair trade sugar into our glass bottled tea. And we're now in the process. We just uh, made the commitment. We launched, we have a brewed er, um, tea that you, if you go to a restaurant, you'll be able to buy it. And so that now includes fair trade sugar. And we're now making the, the step, the final step, which we're underway is to, to put it into this line as well. So nothing ever happens overnight, but it is, we, as, as Dr. King said, that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And, and for us, we know where we're headed. We just have to make sure we can, can, can build, develop the supply chain in a way that's sustainable. And that can also make sense for our business. So we are, we're in process on it. And, and it's been very gratifying to feel like we continually to, you know, make progress toward that goal. All right, so let's get back to Bethesda and Maryland, where Honesty started. Although the idea started in the classroom. And I always, when I talk to a university audience, you never know when your next great idea may come up. And you never know if your professor could be your co-founder, as it was for me. Um, so the book that you have received today is a comic book. Uh, and here's a picture from um, one, of the, one of the scenes, although this is the e-book, which is in color. Your, your, your um, hard copy is three color. But this is my co-founder, Barry, and this is supposed to be me in the bottom right-hand corner. And we were in a case study of the beverage industry, talking about what, the competitive dynamics of the beverage industry, what was going on, the cola wars. And Barry asked, is there anything missing? You know, you, there's so many beverages, and you can walk down any grocery aisle and see hundreds of options. Is it conceivable there was something missing? And at the time, I said, yeah, there, they, there's, there's lots of different options, different colors, different sizes. But back in 1995, they almost all had the same sweetness levels. And when I, I, I ran track in college, and I was always thirsty, and I never wanted something with five or six teaspoons of sugar per serving, why wasn't anybody making a, a drink with one or two teaspoons of sugar? And that was the idea. I said, why isn't somebody doing that? And Barry was very much in agreement. He said, we should be making samples. Let's do some focus groups. And I said, you know, I'm, I got to find a job. It's a nice idea, but I'm not ready to launch it. A few years later, so I moved down to Bethesda. I started working for the Calvert Group, which does socially responsible investing. And uh, I, I, a few years, this was back in 1997, I went for a run in New York City after giving a presentation. And I went to a beverage cooler, and I saw the same problem. And I said, now I think I am ready to do something about this. And I reached out to Barry, and he had just come back from India. And he had not only was still excited about the idea, but he had come up with the name Honest Tea. And for me, that kind of felt like, oh, that's it. You know, it, it all connects. And so um, we applied for the trademark. And it's, it's a little funny story. We applied for it two different ways. So we did apply for Honest Tea, two words. But we also applied for H-O-N-E-S-T-E-A. And when we made that application, we heard back from Nestle's trademark lawyer who said, we see your application and you know, we're not comfortable with you marketing a product called Ho Nestle. That uh, is, doesn't, you know, doesn't, you know, that's, that's, we're not comfortable with that. And I said, well, I don't think we're comfortable marketing a product called Ho Nestle. So we're going to withdraw that application if you let us keep the honest tea mark. And we did, and, and that was how we gained the trademark. So um, I left my job at Calvert. Uh, I started writing the business plan for honest tea. Barry came down to Bethesda. We brewed five thermoses of tea in my kitchen. We got an empty Snapple bottle that we pasted a label on. We managed to get an appointment with Whole Foods, and we brought them to the buyer and said, we want to sell this in your stores. And the buyer said, yeah, we'll take 15,000 bottles. And that was a very scary moment, because we never made more than any, you know, all we had made was in our kitchen. So 
<laughs> took a deep breath and we said, great, give us you know, three months and we'll have your, our product to your shelves. And I'll share with you a bit about how we did it. But there's another interesting element, and, and, and as I was talking with the dean about how you balance your personal and professional lives, the, literally the day that Barry and I were making the tea in our kitchen, uh, my wife walks in and with our middle son and she has this ashen look on her face. Our, our son at the time was, this was 1998 now, so he was four years old. And I said, oh, she must be so upset. The kitchen's such a mess. I said, oh, no, we're going to clean this up. And she was like, I, that's not the issue. So our middle son had just been diagnosed with a very serious heart ailment, a, a coarctation of the, his aorta was closed off. and was going to have to have major surgery. And, um, you know, that was a, obviously here I, you know, if, if any other sort of scenario, I would have, you know, sort of stopped everything and said, we've got to, um, I've got to, I, I, I'm going to have to take some leave from work. Um, but in fact, I had already had a pre-existing appointment to go to Whole Foods the next day. This was, you know, the big break for Honest Tea, so I had no choice but to, to um, keep the meeting. And uh, this was one of many occasions where I really had to compartmentalize. I mean, I, um, I had to make sure I was focused in the Whole Foods meeting. I also had to make sure I was there for our son. And in fact, so he had, um, we got the appointment, as I said, we got the 15,000 bottle order. And then over the next few weeks, we had to figure out how to scale Honest Tea and have our son go through this major operation. And, you know, I, I spent every night with him at Children's Hospital just, just down the street. Um, it was a very incredibly intense experience, intense personally, intense on the business side. Um, and we, we talk about that in the book as well. But that's just part of life. So anyway, we, we, got, we were up and running with the business. And what we found is we made that first order to Whole Foods. And we found that we were quickly gaining an audience not with everybody. This was a drink that is, not, is still not for everybody. There's some people who just look for more sugar. But for people who were looking for less sugar, this was the only thing. And we got these great emails. This is one from uh, a woman who called in from Kalamazoo, Michigan. And she went to our website and she thought, how responsible are you? That is just so everything. I wish you did everything. I wish you did my banking. I wish you were my neighbors. Thank you so much. And then we had this guy out in California who had an honest tea tattoo. So they're like people who really were into this product. Um, and for whom this, there really was no other option. And, and so we started to do really well in natural food stores. And um, we knew that to really grow, we had to get distribution beyond natural food stores because our goal was never just to sell healthy drinks to healthy people. We really wanted to sell healthy drinks to everybody. We talk about democratizing organics, making these products available in convenience stores, in restaurants, uh, grocery stores. And so in order to do that, we had to get distribution beyond the natural food distributors. And so we went to the traditional beverage distributors, the folks who distributed Nantucket Nectars or uh, Snapple or Arizona. And we got rejected in so many different ways. So some said, you know, it's not sweet enough. Other would say it's too expensive or it tastes like grass or the, it's not flashy enough or it needs to be an energy drink. I mean, we got um, so many different <laughs> flavors of rejection. It was... It was um, it was only, the only exception was when someone would say, oh, we'll give this a try. Um, and so instead of working with beverage distributors, we had to find different ways to go to market. And we developed what we called our own network of C distributors. And it, C doesn't describe their quality. It just happens that they were all um, started with the letter C. So we, wanted, we knew we wanted to get to gourmet stores, uh, Dean and DeLuca or Bradley Food and Beverage, for those of you who know that store. And it turns out, initially, I was making the deliveries. And the guy said, well, we're kind of a gourmet store here, so you driving up in your Saturn station wagon and unloading cases, it just doesn't look right. Um, so he says, why don't you talk to my cheese distributor? And sure enough, we got a cheese distributor to start going to gourmet stores. Then we wanted to get to Bethesda Bagels, uh, because that's a great place for people to try new drinks. He said, I don't work with a cheese distributor. Why don't you talk to my corned beef distributor? And sure enough, if you've ever seen these trucks that say Savile Foods, that's, that was our corned beef distributor. Then we wanted to go to the grocery stores, and, um, you know, independent grocery stores at first. And they said, well, we don't work with those guys, but if you can talk to our charcoal distributor. And that was how we got to grocery stores. So it was a real patchwork of distribution. But it got us to the shelf. And what we found is we were getting more shelf space. And what these beverage distributors found is we were taking shelf space away from them. So eventually they said, well, look, if he's either going to um, take our shelf space or we can start distributing his product. And we were starting to work with beverage distributors, which mostly was a good thing, except these are tough folks to deal with. This is, um, it's very territorial. So think about, if you go to a grocery store, if you, if you look at um, the cereal aisle, right, 
if Kellogg's Raisin Bran gets depleted, it's not like someone's going to go put Cheerios there. These are all planogrammed. But you go to a place like Bethesda Bagels, as soon as the Honest Tea sells out, that shelf space is up for grabs. And so these are folks who are used to fighting and sharp elbowed. And I was trying to think of a good um, illustration of how to, how to give you a feel for that. So I'm going to actually play for you a voicemail. And I'll apologize in advance because the language is a little coarse, but, but it is for educational purposes. Um, this is a voicemail that one of our distributors left for one of our salespeople. And we'll just play that. Yo, Mike, this is Louie from Twisted Distributors. Look, all the things that you f up, if you don't handle that fing that works for you, bro, you could take your fing honesty and you could stick it up Dan Cavanaugh's fing big. You understand what I'm saying? So, I'm telling you, f you, f your honesty. You get the idea. So, the, <laughs> the point is, you know, here we are talking about mission driven, people driven businesses. And as you might guess, he's not necessarily a mission driven um, distributor. Uh, and yet, our, for our business to work, we have, it has to work for Louis. Like, he's not someone who's going to do this out of charity, right? He's got a lot of products in his portfolio. And if, he's can make, if he can make more money selling a different product, guess what he's going to sell? So he has to be able to make money um, selling our product. And, feel, and for all the other things, you know, the fair trade and the organic, that's not necessarily of consequence to him. And by extension, you can say those same rules are true for investors. We raise money from investors. Some of them liked us or some of them liked me, but they weren't in it for charity. They were doing it for a return. And I'm proud of the fact that our founding investors made 26 times their money uh, when they invested in Honest Tea. Um, so it's really important to keep that in mind. This has to be a business that functions a lot, you know, that is competitive, period. Not, well, no, I don't want to say competitive for a socially responsible business, because that somehow creates an expectation that we don't hold ourselves to the same high standard. So anyway, uh, we managed to build a, a patchwork of those distributors, working with beverage distributors. And then what happened was we started getting approached by large national chains, because we were growing. We were the best-selling tea in the natural foods world. But and the mainstream groceries started shrinking. Stores like Safeway and Kroger saw their market share starting to decline. And they said, what are we going to do? We've got to compete with Whole Foods. We've got to get where the margin is and where the growth is. And, and, and so they would approach us and say, we want your product in our stores. And I said, well, I've got a distribution coverage in the East Coast, the Mid-Atlantic, or the California. They'd say, well, we've got stores in Chicago, stores in Texas. When you are able to give us distribution for all the stores, let us know, and we'll carry your product. And we were at this crossroads. Do we, do we try to scale this business, or do we stay in our niche? And as you might guess from the way, well, how things turned out, but also from hearing me, you know, this was not a small ambition to this thing. We really want to have an impact on diet. We want to have an impact on agriculture. And so in order to do that, we said, let's make sure we get scale. So we were receptive when we were approached. We actually were approached by a lot of different multinationals. But the one that seemed to fit the best for us was Coca-Cola. And, and I want to share with you Coca-Cola's reason for investing in Honest Tea. This was a slide they presented to their board back in 2007 in recommending the investment. So they talked about the megatrends. Where, where is society headed? Not just the fads, not sort of you know, paleo or low-carb diets. They said, look at these trends, health and wellness, environmental consciousness, and social responsibility. There's a small area where these all overlap and fuse together. And while that area of overlap is small in 2007, if you look five years out, or of course, seven years out, that's a, that's a big opportunity. That's really the new standard for doing business. And it's interesting. Last week, I was in Chicago. I was meeting with the city. The mayor there is trying to um, develop a health initiative. And what was great about it wasn't just the health department. It was the parks department, it was the education department, the transportation department. This recognition that any decision we make, there's no such thing as just a health decision or just an environmental decision. We really have to look at all the factors together. And so Coca-Cola's um, decision to invest in honesty wasn't just about being a health brand or just an, or just an environmental brand or just sort of a nutrition-oriented brand. It was this idea that we uh, embrace all three of those. So Coke invested in 2008 bought 40% of the company, and as you heard, bought the rest of it in 2011. And I want to share with you how we've scaled the business, um, what, that's, what that's meant. Well, the first and biggest impact was distribution. So before uh, Coke invested, we're in about 15,000 stores, mostly in the health foods channel. Uh, today, we're in over 100,000 stores. And I was just telling the dean, we've just signed a contract, a national deal for one of the largest um, restaurant chains in the country that's going to be announced in May. So for us, these are really exciting inflection points of how we scale the business. What about production? Well, <laughs> there was a very classic um, 
illustration of the difference between a professor launching a business and a student was when uh, we tried to figure out production because I was worried before I left um, Calvert, I was asked Barry, how are we going to be able to make this much tea? Like, I know how to make a tea bag <laughs> and, you know, make tea in that. But how do you multiply times 10,000? Barry says, well, it's not that hard, right? You just you add, you know, 10,000 times more tea and you filter it. But what happened was it was very complicated to filter out the tea leaves. Most bottled teas are not made with real tea leaves. They're not, um, our ingredient when it comes to the bottling plant are tea leaves. It's not a powder or a syrup or a concentrate. And um, so how do, you, how do you move from concept, from theory to practice? And a lot of people at the time said, well, when Coca-Cola buys Honest Tea, they're going to move to that powder or concentrate because it's all about, you know, how do you make it faster and cheaper? Well, when we started, this is a, a picture from our first production runs up in Buffalo, New York at an apple juice plant. These are bags, mesh bags. Uh, we put tea leaves in, we dunk them in this boiling tank. We get about 18,000 bottles in a day. There'd be about an inch and a half of sediment on the bottom that people would sort of have to chew through. <laughs> and then uh, that, it was OK. The tea wasn't great, but it was, it was tea. Uh, and then in, we evolved to this large tea wheel. We put tea leaves in here and spin it. We can make about 60,000 bottles a day, get about a half inch of tea sediment. But that's not scalable, right? We're trying to go to 100,000 stores. So what do we do? Um, well, we developed these two multi-million dollar tea brewing systems. This is one of them up in Northampton, Massachusetts. And this is one in Sacramento, California. That's me on the third, third floor of the, uh, the plant. And each of these makes 500,000 bottles a day. Uh, better yield, better taste, more consistency, better water, better efficiencies uh, with the tea leaves. And the ingredient that comes in is still tea leaves. And so that's how we scale the production in, in, in a way that is still, as I said, uh, uh, you know, the, true to what uh, the brand stands for. What about innovation? Well, one of the best ideas we came up actually started with my son. I have three sons. My middle son, who's now a junior in college, this was back in 2006. I used to make the lunches, which generally meant I put things in their lunch boxes. I'd, I'd make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or something. But um, juice pouches. And at the time, I was putting in Capri Sun, the blue you know pouches. And he said to me one morning, he says, Daddy, I know you sell healthy drinks to grown-ups, but these drinks you put in my lunchbox are really sweet, really sugary. And I looked, it was 100 calories per pouch, which is more calories per ounce than a can of soda. And that's what I bet some of you probably had in your lunchbox as well. And I realized, oh my gosh, what an amazing, uh, first of all, like, I'm embarrassed. I, yeah, he's right. And second of all, what an amazing business opportunity. Let's take the same properties about organic, authentic, um, less sweet and put them in a kid's drink pouch. So Honest Kids, uh, we launched. Initially, we had it with cane sugar. Coca-Cola helped us develop enough of a, a supply chain for organic grape juice to be able to take out all the sugar and sweeten it only with grape juice, organic grape juice. Um, nutritionally, it's the same, same 40 calories, but when the first ingredient is juice instead of sugar, much better uh, optics for the parent. This line has exploded. It is now more than 30% of our business. Here's what's happened to the kids' drink business. That's what's happened to the Capri Sons of the world. This is what's happened to Honest Kids. So, you know, uh, I, I still think, <laughs> I love all my sons, but I still give my son credit for like, wow, <laughs> uh, what a great idea and um, a transformational. And, and what's really neat is to look at the ripples that happen from, because of this dynamic, brands like Capri Sun, first they moved to 75 calories, they dropped high fructose corn syrup as their, one of their ingredients. I just read um, just this month that they're moving out at 50 calories. And obviously, there's a lot of factors at work here, but I guarantee you they wouldn't have made that shift had it not been for other brands like us saying, look, you can sell a less sweet drink to kids and succeed. Now, any self-respecting kid is still going to choose the sweeter drink if given the choice. But when they're in a lunchbox situation, they don't really have a choice. So as long as they say, this is good enough for me to drink, the parent is going to be happier buying it. What about the rest of our innovations? Well, all along the way, our whole story has been about mission-driven innovation. So first low sugar bottle tea, first organic, first fair trade, uh, launching Honest Kids, launching a drink called Honest Fizz. And all along the way, those innovations have really um, both driven our growth and highlighted our growth. And we continue to, to you know, um, push ourselves to keep innovating. That's, how, that's our competitive advantage, and that's what, how we've um, focused on. Of course, we've had some failures, too. We had a line called Honest Kombucha that failed, a, a line called Coconova. Did anyone here taste that one? 
That's why that one failed. So <laughs> we've certainly had our failures as well. One of the things we've done just this year, uh, the past few months, is thinking about how do we elevate our branding so it's more clear exactly what we're selling, that we're all part of one family. So this was our glass line, the line you saw on President Obama's desk. Uh, and we, for, for the first 17 years, that's what that line looked like. We just re-updated -up the line to put more emphasis on the word honest, to take the, away the black bars and make it more accessible as a line, to elevate the art. And we did the same with our plastic bottle line. So you see here, um, this is what it looked like uh, just a few months ago. We've now taken, once again, more emphasis on the word honest, more emphasis on the word organic, highlighting the ingredients. Uh, and this, for us, is another step to, to unify the line and also to make it um, more accessible. Other innovations, I mentioned Honest Fizz. So this is a zero-calorie organic. It's the only line of uh, organic zero-calorie soda. This is the lemonade line I mentioned that we did with the fair trade sugar and then K-cups. So we've got all these innovations going on. What about marketing? How do we make our brand, how do we make people aware of our brand? Because you don't see us you know, advertising during the Super Bowl or during March Madness or on American Idol. So how do we make people aware of what we're doing? How do we create awareness? And this is a challenge when you're not spending a lot of money. But we've always, in the beginning, all we did was sampling. We just gave products to people when you were able to talk to them about it. So we said, well, if we can't, uh, we're in 100,000 stores, we can't talk with everybody the same way. How do we find ways to interact with people? And we've done this experiment now for five years called the National Honesty Index. And what it involves is putting up racks of tea, a sign that says honest store, a dollar a bottle, honor system, a Lucite box with a slot for people to put money in, but no uniform personnel, no visible cameras. We just want to see what happens. We want to see how honest people are when no one's watching. So any guesses? What percent of people do you think put money in the box? Any guesses? 80%? All right, we're going to show a video. Uh, we'll show you what happened with the National Honesty Index. Now, in addition to watching the, the results of the social experiment, think about this as a marketing investment as well. Think about the return on investment as an advertisement. Here's a story that offers a glimmer of hope. It's all about this question, how honest are you? The folks at the beverage brand Honest Tea conduct a little bit of an experiment. People can uh, be faced with the decision of whether to purchase a bottle or whether to steal a bottle. And we're just kind of observing to see what they do. Look at the setup. Shelves of iced tea, signs telling you what type of tea, and a clear Lucite box full of cash. At Honest Tea, we seek to infuse honesty and transparency into our products by using organic ingredients. And so we wanted to conduct a national experiment to understand how much the American public embodies those same values of honesty and transparency. In addition to conducting the physical experiment in all 50 states with the racks, we also created an online component where people could participate in an honor pact and share a piece of content or not, they would still get the coupon for a free bottle of honest tea. I think there's a lot of good honest people out there, but I bet there's a lot of people that will grab and run. <laughs> You often see people, they'll look around, is anyone watching, right. what are other people doing, what will people think of me? They want to figure out, you know, what's going on exactly, uh, if there are cameras, if there are pictures being taken, etc. This is genius on your part, because you've taken your brand and the name of your team, what it stands for, and done something really creative that gets a lot of attention. Dude, I think it's a great idea. It really shows the integrity of people, mm -hmm. and uh, Taurus kind of just shows what people really are about. Altogether, we saw that uh, national results, 95% of people were honest. Wow, that's encouraging. The most honest city, you want to guess? Honolulu. You were looking in the teleprompter. Why are you asking me? Of course, I mean, I'm looking right at On the other hand, in Providence, Rhode Island, only 80% did the honest thing. Oh, are you saying you would have dipped in and taken one of those? No, of course not. I would have been honest. But okay. I'm saying if Rhode Island came in last 80% of the time, it's still yeah. much better than I thought. D.C., by the way, got the most improved award. Last year ranked 80% honest. This year, 96% wow. honest. And on the topic of the differences between genders, who do you think is more honest, men or women? 
Blondes are the most truthful of all hair colors. I'm not even going to ask you, Seth, uh, where bald guys come in. So it was interesting to see that online people were just as honest as they were in person. I'm confused by it all. Maybe just honest people like tea. Maybe, maybe that's, that's what maybe it that's what it is. <laughs> So we've done that experiment for five years in a row, and Here's every year we find a way to get Wolf. new, you know, question. a new twist How on it, new coverage. You? And you think about it, all right, let's, if we were trying to get, you know, Anchorage, Alaska Evening News to talk about a, a beverage, I, I don't think we could do it. But this gives us the chance, and as you see, the bottles are talked about, the tea name, the company name is talked about, and it's in a way that's a very positive story, too. I mean, you all sort of thought 80%, a lot, I've heard other people guess worse, so, okay, people are better than, I, than you think they are. And, and we've done the experiment for five years. It's always been between 93 and 95%. Um, so, and, 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 and the story, we always do it in the summer. Uh, this past summer, you remember what, what a terrible summer of news it was. We had the race riots, we had Russia invading Ukraine. And so, for news editors to get a positive story, they actually, oh my, thank you so much. Like, finally, something nice, you know, positive to talk about. So, it's been a, a fun way for us to continue to build a brand. Okay, I want to give you a few closing thoughts, and then let's open it up for discussion. But what does this all mean? What is the impact of what we're doing? Well, first of all, which is the direction we're headed? The nice thing is that if you contrast uh, any of the things that are important about our brand, whether it means organic varieties, fair trade, or zero calorie, they've all increased since uh, the Coca-Cola investment. And then what about the impact on the, the, the sourcing communities? Well, before Coke bought, uh, invested in Honesty, we were buying about 800,000 pounds of organic ingredients. Last year, we bought uh, 6.5 million pounds of organic ingredients. And we'll buy over 10 million this year. And so what it means is when I go to these uh, communities to, to, to meet with the suppliers, it's no longer some guy from Bethesda who launched this company out of house saying, hey, I'd really love you to be organic. It's, you know, a representative of the Coca-Cola company saying, this is one of the fastest growing parts of our business. This is where we're investing. If you want to be our supplier, you need to be fair trade and you need to be organic. And then we'll be happy to review your samples. And so we're clearly um, helping to drive uh, these gardens toward a more sustainable uh, approach to their business. I want to share, um, uh, I started, uh, by the way, got President Obama to, uh, you know, show the tea facing out on uh, his honest tea bottle. And then um, we had a, uh, uh, you know, we were still in touch with that tea garden in Anway province I visited with the bamboo raft. And I heard from our mission director a few weeks ago. She's like, oh, you know, guess what? They, they used our fair trade proceeds um, to buy something. I'm like, oh, no, I hope they didn't buy a bridge. That ruins my whole story. <laughs> She's like, no, no, they bought a boat. So a uh, little, little uh, less tippy way to uh, bring the product to shore. All right, let me give you um, two more, uh, staying with the China theme, I want to give you two Chinese proverbs that, that we um, embrace at Honesty. The first is, well, uh, let me go to this first. If we don't change the direction we're headed, we will end up where we are going. So think about where we're going as a society. It's, it's actually a very discouraging place. The United Nations ranks, uh, every few years, they rank the average life expectancy of all the countries in the world. There's about 200 countries. And even though the United States is the wealthiest nation in the history of the world, even though we have more advanced knowledge of science and medicine than any civilization has ever had, and we spend more per capita on medicine than any civilization, when it comes to ranking average life expectancy, we're not number one, we're not number two, we're number 40. So what did that say about our society, uh, our priorities, our, our lifestyles, our diets, our relationship to the natural world, our, our relationship to each other? The wrong direction. And, and I'm somebody, I, I consider myself very patriotic. I've benefited greatly from you know, this entrepreneurial system we have in this country. But I'm ashamed to see numbers like that. How could that be? How could we let that happen? And, and it's not something that the government is going to be able to change on its own. I don't know that it should try to change it on its own. It's something that has to happen um, from all types of different sectors. And if you go back to what I said in the beginning about how business can be part of the solution, I certainly think that's the case. And I don't think, um, if you think about the direction we're headed, I think big business is largely invested in the current direction. So I think the only way you change it is when entrepreneurs can identify different approaches. And big businesses will invest in them, uh, or they'll be left behind. You think about it, it's, it's depressing. But you can, another way to think about it is, 
wow, that's an incredible business opportunity. You have the world's wealthiest nation literally living, you know, not living up to its potential. And so to be able to, to take an entrepreneurial approach to solve this problem you, you know, is an amazing opportunity. And of course, it can also be a very fulfilling opportunity as well, and, and, and one that can be gratifying and impactful. Um, for me, it certainly is. It's also, though, I want to make it clear, it's not easy. And <laughs> I tried to give you a little bit of the sense of the challenges, whether it's dealing with the distributor like Louis in New York or dealing with the personal challenges that are inevitably going to arise. These are all along the way. Um, there's, there's going to be challenges to doing it. And, 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 and for that matter, even being part of a large multinational, you know, uh, it's, we are a mission-driven company, entrepreneurial, inside a large multinational that thinks in a different way, just about business results and about planning and about growth. And so there's still challenges, uh, but it's still a challenge worth taking. I'll share with you in closing, this is a proverb that is on Honesty's wall when you walk in the office. Those who say it cannot be done should not interrupt the people doing it. So we certainly um, feel like this is the challenge we're still engaged in uh, and still worth, worth taking on every day. Thanks for listening, and we can open up for questions or comments. Happy to take questions. Dean? Seth, you went to Yale and did Right. It has a reputation of being sort of a social consciousness. Uh, um, uh, what did you not get there? So, as you know, that's what we're, we are. Yeah. Yeah. What did you not get at the Yale Business School that the business school at Catholic U should offer to yeah. promote this kind of business? That's a good question. Well, when I was in business school, first of all, there was very little emphasis on entrepreneurship. Um, and, and, and that has changed nationally now. People recognize, number one, students are interested in entrepreneurship. Number two, there just aren't as many big business career paths as there used to be, right? Uh, whether it's the investment lot, there are fewer big banks, you know, fewer corporate jobs. But number three, students, because of the, the, the potential, um, it's, it's what attracts a lot of students to think entrepreneurially. So one of the things that, that I kind of advocated for myself was um, learning entrepreneurship. And in a business school, what that means is how to write a business plan, how to read a business plan, you know, looking at a business. So um, I remember I was in my investment course. There was, no cor there was no curriculum around venture capital or private equity. And I actually, I, I wasn't necessarily, didn't make myself too popular, but I advocated in the class, I presented to my classmates, I said, I want us to get a special class on how to think about entrepreneurial finance. And it literally meant everyone in the class had to come in for an extra class and come in. And, and, and they, but they, to their credit, they, they voted for me. Uh, you know, they voted my proposal, so we, we got that class. Um, because you have to be able to think and understand the, all the elements of a business plan. You're taught them all, of course, in business school, but integrating them is, is, is important. So one of the things that we did, I encourage all of you to, to see if you can do, is uh, we meaning my, my I, I had a, a, a classmate, we wrote a business plan. Uh, it was a, not at all about beverages, it was a, actually a diagnostic company, um, but it was a wonderful experience, an intense experience. It was kind of like uh, writing a senior thesis to, to have to think about all the elements and present all the elements of a business plan. And even though we didn't pursue that particular business, we learned we had an appetite for the entrepreneurial experience. And, you, and, and look, if you um, think you want to be an entrepreneur and then you do this experience and you say, hey, this isn't for me, that's almost, that's probably even more <laughs> valuable. <laughs> Say, you know what, I'm just not cut out for this. But you, you might learn along the way, wow, I, I love thinking about how to take an idea from its idea, you know, all the way to commercialization. So um, that's a critical piece. And business schools are doing that more now, but I, I think that's a wonderful experience. So um, I was, when I was at Yale, that business plan we wrote was, we, we created because there was a, a competition, a new enterprise competition. The school didn't have that. It was the first year. We, we ended up winning it. But I would encourage the, uh, any business school to think about having a new enterprise competition, challenge the students to develop and present uh, a business plan. Um, and then even just a casework around reading a business plan. You know, and our business plan, by the way, is available at our, on our website, honesty.com, our original business plan. Read it and see what's missing or assess it. If you were an, entrep if you were an investor, would you invest? Why not? Why or why not? Um, so those are some things that are good. I think the other thing that is critical that I didn't get at business school was any sales experience. So 
I think in, it, there's, a very, there's a tendency, it's very easy to think that sales isn't um, an academic skill, which it isn't. I mean, you don't, it, it, but it is a skill. And um, as soon as we launched on this tea, I realized, you know what? We got to go sell tea. Like, we can talk about our fair trade and organic and our branding, but if someone's not out there every day trying to put more tea on shelves and then eventually put tea in people's bladders, um, <laughs> then, then this business isn't going to work. So have to have experience selling. And selling is hard work. It's, it, it means getting rejected. It means thinking about your pitch. Um, but it's critical. And for me, it wasn't just selling tea. I had to sell investors. I had to sell employees. I had to sell the, the buyers from the stores. I had to sell the distributors. You know, I, as you probably can tell, I'm still selling, right? I'm still trying to sell you on what we're doing, our approach to business. So um, sales is another key piece. And I think the last thing that I would have loved to have gotten out of business school, so you take accounting courses and you, you work with Excel and you look at growth numbers um, and they look so nice on a spreadsheet. But when you get to reality and there's so many variables that aren't, that don't show up in an accounting statement. So, you know, we sold our, we sold, we, we, we landed a sale in, in Connecticut. And then we said, oh, that's great. We sold $10,000 worth of tea. That's really good. Then 30 days went by and we didn't get paid by the distributor. And then 45 days get, went by, we didn't get paid. And I realized that that income that we thought we had or the accounts receivable, we didn't get any payment from this guy. And all of a sudden, you know, there's other elements that just don't show up in a straight line accounting treatment. And a little bit more of that real world experience would have been helpful. Question? Thank you. <laughs> Say that part again so people can hear. <laughs> I love honest tea. When I was little, I used to add water to my Nest tea to dilute it. Yeah. So this was, this was very helpful. But um, I love the little story you told about them not having a bridge because when you first said that, I was expecting you to say there wasn't a bridge, so we built a bridge for them. And um, it was the exact opposite. So can you talk to us a little bit about um, since Coca-Cola is now supporting you and where you go and get your tea from, you don't necessarily have control over whether they start becoming more innovative or building a bridge and maybe tainting some of the tea you have. So when you're dealing, when you're outsourcing or dealing with a big company, how do you um, in turn stay honest yeah. or true to your um, yeah. original, original goal for the company when you have all these kind of outside factors? Playing? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it, it, it kind of taps to why did we partner with Coca-Cola, right? Um, and as you know, and, and I'm sure whether you talk about Snapple or Nantech at Nectars, there's so many brands that have partnered with big companies and then kind of lost their mojo, lost what made them special. So for us, we, in this case, I really still have a great deal of control over where we buy our tea from. Part of the reason is because I'm still around. Um, and, and, and that's often the case. The founders, uh, I, I'm friendly with the, f the folks who were the founders of Vitamin Water. And um, he said, yeah, you know, after Coke bought us, well, for the first few months, they wanted to know our opinion on things. For the next few months, they wanted to know our, um, you know, our phone number. <laughs> after that, they didn't want to know us. Like, we were done. There was no involvement. And because our business is so different from anything Coca-Cola had, it was really important that we were there. And, and we intentionally created the structure so that Coke, for the first three years, was a minority investor. We still control, they, they, they couldn't drive any decisions. They, they were times where they said, we want you to do something. And I'd say, I'm sorry, I appreciate your opinion. But like any, my, any investor, minority investor, I'm, I'm going to do what I think is right. And the good thing is that um, during those three years, we continued to grow the business and scale the business. And so when they had the option to buy the rest of the business, they took the option, but they said, let's keep the structure intact. It's still working. So um, we haven't had, there's been no pressure on any of the ingredients we buy to, to make a compromise. And as I said, we've, we've elevated. In fact, when Coke invested in 2008, I would say about 35% of our tea was fair trade. By 2011, all of our tea was fair trade. So absolutely increased our cost of goods. There's no scenario where it didn't. Um, just the same with the sugar. When we move to fair trade sugar, there's an extra premium that goes back to the communities. It makes our sugar more expensive. What changes though, this bottle used to cost us about uh, 16 cents. And when we started working with Coke, it cost us 11 cents. So I look at it and say, okay, there's five cents that I, I'm gonna save three cents. I'm gonna put more toward the margin, but two cents I'm gonna use to 
upgrade our ingredients, to upgrade our commitments with these communities. So the business still has to perform. And the way that it works, and this is like any large company, and one of the reasons um, some of these acquired companies didn't work out so well is that the company got bought by the big company and then they didn't start delivering the business results. And so inevitably, the big company's gonna say, okay, well, we gotta make, some, we gotta make this m make sense. So we're gonna find a way to make it, set, make it make sense. The good news for us is every year we've over-delivered our business plan. And so uh, when we can over-deliver our business plan, that renews our license to do it the way we do it. Um, and that's why I go back to it. I say, this business, just like the business has to work for Louis, the business has to work for Coca-Cola. And this isn't a charitable effort on Coca-Cola's part. This isn't about lose, giving up margin or giving up market share. We have to grow volume, we have to grow margin, and we have to grow our operating income. And every year we've exceeded our targets, uh, which creates us, you know, I'd say renews our license to keep doing that. Uh, you, t yeah. you talked about uh, how you were one month balancing uh, producing for Whole Foods and dealing with your son's treatment. Yeah. Now as a huge TEO, uh, <laughs> how do you find a balance between a family life and uh, heading up a, a company? Thank you for asking that. That's, that's a really important theme. Um, so first of all, it, it's, it's, a, it's an imperfect science, um, but I would say it's a marathon, right? So I'm, I'm a distance runner, I think that way, and it's not, I, there's times when I sprint, and that day I had in Chicago yet, uh, last week, that was an 18 hour day, but um, you know what, I got home in time so that even though I only got <laughs> three and a half hours of sleep, I was with my son the next morning eating breakfast with him. So um, for me, it's, um, you know, what do I, what, you, there's got to be a trade-off somewhere, right? What do you give up? I'm probably less of a schmoozer than I, my, some of my friends. You know, I don't go out to cocktail hours. Um, my son, now he's a, he's a senior in high school, the, my youngest, um, and so we just started baseball season. And so I get invitations for meetings and I'll say, look, I got a, you know, I got a guy coming in next week. You're, you're welcome to spend the day with us. I got a game at 4.30. You're welcome to come to the game. Uh, my son has a game. I don't have a game. <laughs> but, but that's what I'm going to be doing next Tuesday at 4.30. Uh, and, and you know what? Actually, it's a great way to interact with somebody over around a baseball game. It's much more relaxed. But it just says, this is what is important to me and what I'm going to do. And, and I'm by equal token, or actually, at least as a, pro, a larger token, is, is my wife, um, who for 17 years was just, uh, I mean, she has her own job, she works in the nonprofit field, but is, it has been incredibly supportive, and from the start before, um, supportive of this vision. And so um, I have to recognize, you know, what, what are the things that are going to be important to her? And so the idea that we can have some stability in the family, that I can be there for dinner or, or there for breakfast, or when she only takes a few trips a year, like, I'm grounded. Like, as much as I travel, those weeks are off, you know, whatever it is, I'm not going to leave town then because I've got to be able to, to fill in. So um, I think it's a, you have to be very deliberate about this because it, there's, there's always opportunities and, and, and work opportunities to, to not um, make those choices. And so you just have to be disciplined about it. And, and um, I, I feel that uh, I certainly try to also uh, model that for our employees. So. I would say that I'm pretty consistently leaving the office at 5.30. No, I do work at night um, or sometimes on the weekends, but um, I, I just want to make sure for our employees, too, they have that feeling that we're, it's their, we want to be part of their whole lives, and we have to support them throughout. There we go. Okay, uh, so all right, I think we're good. Thank you very much. <laughs>